everyone. My name is Borislav Gerasimov, and I'm Communications and Advocacy Coordinator at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women, GATW, together with Sharmila Parmanant, a PhD student in Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge, is holding a series of conversations this year um, to evaluate um, the Palermo Protocol Against Human Trafficking that was adopted by the UN 20 years ago. And today we are joined by Maria Angelkovic from Astra Anti-Trafficking Action, uh, an NGO uh, in Serbia. Hi, Maria, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Hi, and thank you for invitation. Um, so, hi, Maria. Thank you for being here. Um, can you tell us a bit more about Astra and the work that you do? Uh, yes, uh, Astra is a local uh, Serbian grassroots um, NGO that exists now for 20 years. Uh, we start our work in 2000 and uh, actually uh, the first idea that we had is that we will work on prevention and education about trafficking in human beings. But after we received the first call from the victim of trafficking, we develop our biggest program now, and that is the program for direct assistance for victims. So we provide uh, medical, legal, psychological assistance to victims, but also support during the integration period. We also work a lot on prevention and education. We do trainings for the professionals, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, police officers, social workers, journalists, uh, labor inspectors, uh, doctors, and so on. Uh, and also we do a lot of reporting to the UN uh, committees uh, to um, Council of Europe bodies like Greta, like, uh, to uh, European Commission. Yesterday we had um, a pub actually European Commission published the country report for Serbia that we also um, gave our um, contribution. Uh, until today we received uh, 45,000 calls at our SOS hotline. It's uh, still the only SOS hotline in Serbia for victims of trafficking and their families. It's a licensed uh, uh, hotline and we supported uh, 540 victims of trafficking, provided them with direct support. We do a lot of, as Bobby knows, a lot of networking. It's necessary for our work, especially direct assistance. Uh, locally in Serbia, we have anti-trafficking uh, network. Yeah, regionally, we are part of La Strada platform, and also globally with W uh, network. And uh, actually, uh, we are monitoring what's going on in the field of trafficking, not only in Serbia but also worldwide. This question has two. Uh, strands like one is how the situation with human trafficking has changed in Serbia, uh, you know, in terms of recruitment or exploitation, and on the other hand, how the anti trafficking response uh, has changed uh, by the government but also NGOs. If you want to reflect mm -hmm. on that, so when Astra started 20 years ago, it was a very, um, let's say, um, tricky political uh, moment, as you know, it was after Milosevic period. So also it was a tricky moment for the um, NGOs in, in global, in Serbia, because in, for all NGOs, because we were persuaded as uh, foreign betrayers, someone who is paid from the West, you know, and so on, someone who is talking about some trafficking, and that is something that exists only in dirty West and not in our country and so on. Uh, and majority of us who, uh, founded Astra, actually, uh, we already had some um, activistic background in the 90s during Milosevic, you know, we were part of the student demonstrations um, and um, every day on the street and so on. In 2000, after Milosevic fall, actually after 5th of October, which was two, two days ago, was 20th anniversary also, uh, of that, uh, we uh, we were in a quite uh, bit by bit new situation, you know, like uh, we saw how institutions start to be open, uh, how police uh, suddenly uh, want to talk to us, and only a year ago we were beaten on the street by the same police, you know. 
uh, but it was interesting because traffic, trafficking was a very new topic. So no one before Astra in Serbia started this issue, you know, to talk about the issue, and I, uh, issue of trafficking. And I remember the first training on trafficking, it was in Amsterdam, uh, held by Admira and La Strada. And uh, that was the first time we faced, you know, I was... Uh, 25 years old then, and I remember my uh, director of the organization where, where I used to work said, you know, it's a dangerous topic, it's organized crime, you shouldn't be there, it's really dangerous. But for me as a lawyer, it was interesting because it was it had connection with the uh, criminal law, which, uh, uh, which I like. And um, uh, actually that was our first step. So we, at the beginning, we discussed, should we use word trafficking or majority of the people in Serbia use the word, uh, or, or to use Serbian word, you know, because uh, the nationalistic uh, rhetorics were very strong that time. So like, we shouldn't use foreign words, like English word trafficking. So we were thinking about these small details, how to introduce this to regular, you know, population. And also, it was obvious that it was so much, uh, so much mixing with prostitution and trafficking. So we very, we were very cautious how to to introduce this, and we start with the large com media campaign, "Open Your Eyes." And I remember it was shocking. You know, it was all over the TV and radio and billboards, and um, and this is how it started. Our, as I said in the first question, our idea was that we will just work on. Uh, information, like to introduce this topic to the people, like prevention, education, we will go to schools, we will tell people what they need, uh, what documents they need if they want to go abroad, to work, and so on. That was our, you know, uh, childish idea. But then uh, I remember when we received the first call from the victim of trafficking, and then uh, we didn't know what to do. We realized, actually, that, okay, the first reaction was, we will call police, you know, but uh, what police, 911? I mean, uh, the, we understood by uh, in second that there are no institutions who are dealing with trafficking, no social services, no police, uh, the doctors, they don't know anything about it, you know. So then we realized that we need to, to work with victims, we need to support them, and that is how parallelly we start to, helping building, to build system, uh, anti-trafficking national reform mechanism, but also to work with the victims and to support them. And parallelly, of course, in the Europe and worldwide, there are some other political changes like uh, Stability Pact, later OSCE, ODIR, who start to work on trafficking. So these all mechanism has actually supported not only changes in Serbia, but also in other countries in the region. And um, I, uh, then in 2002, the first national anti-trafficking team was created and the first coordinator. And uh, then we became a part of that mechanism. And uh, then we start with the first trainings, you know, for police and then uh, uh, starting to build this, um, uh, the, this uh, uh, trust with these institutions because we didn't trust to them, they didn't trust to us. So it was like, we needed time for that. And I'm proud to say that we still cooperate with some police officers um, and some prosecutors from that time, you know, who are now uh, educators on our trainings, you know, educating their colleagues, younger colleagues. That is the difference between then and now regarding institutions. Now, of course, 20 years after, we have this national reform mechanism, even more developed than than then. Um, we have social services uh, dealing with victims. We have um, a lot of professionals. We uh, we have people who knows about it. You know, regular people who heard about trafficking. I think that is one of our biggest impact because we had eleven, I think, media campaigns until now, large scale campaigns. Uh, but uh, there is always but in NGOs. Uh, what uh, maybe as an NGO we would like to see changes um, happen more rapid, more faster. But sometimes it is not possible. We need to follow the rhythm of institutions. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we also witness a lot of political changes in Serbia. Uh, 
since 2000. So as you know, in 2003, our prime minister was shot. And then uh, after that, we again saw the clo uh, uh, institutions closing down. Um, uh, we saw, uh, um, again, some ups and downs in cooperation. Uh, recently, we, in the last maybe ten, uh, eight to 10 years, we see a lot of gongos among NGOs uh, popping up like popcorns, you know, and then you need to explain actually who is doing what, you know, and then um, uh, again, we see some kind of uh, um, not closing institutions, but we see this uh, refer, we are the part of the refer mechanism, but we don't see that NGOs are equal partners in this, but rather some kind of um, furniture for the reports and, uh, you know, uh, like, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, being in the room is uh, uh, kind of giving a legitimacy to, to the process, but sometimes you feel that your voice is not uh, heard enough. Also, when you see, now we have everything, you know, all the documents, strategies, action plans, standard operating procedures, everything is there, you know, reports and so on. But then when you see this action plan, you don't see Astra anywhere in the action plan, but NGOs, who, who is running the activity, Ministry of Social Affairs with the NGOs as partners. Even we have only two NGOs that are actually dealing with victims in Serbia right now. Your question was also referring to the uh, trends in trafficking. They're also different. We see differences in, 20, in when we started 20 years ago, majority of our clients were victims from uh, identified victim citizens of uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Moldova, and so on. Uh, actually, maybe 80 to 90 percent uh, victims, uh, women and girls who are victims of sexual exploitation. Nowadays, the situation is opposite. We have majority of the uh, victims identify uh, more than 80 percent are Serbian citizens internally trafficked, trafficked from one city in Serbia to another. Uh, also, still, also women and girls, uh, majority of the victims like victims of sexual exploitation, but we have more and more cases of labor exploitation. Uh, we have uh, around 30% in total for 20 years, 30% of all our clients that we are working with are uh, children. Uh, actually, uh, minors under 18 years old, also girls and um, for sexual exploitation and boys for forced begging and forced criminality. Uh, but we have uh, more and more cases of labor exploitation recently. Actually, during Corona, we have explosion of labor exploitation cases for some reason. And um, uh, yeah, what we also uh, witnessed during these 20 years is change in uh, uh, modus operandi of traffickers. Uh, 20 years ago, we saw more victims with bruisers, with, um, you know, marks from the cigars, with the broken legs and arms and so on. Nowadays, I I'm not saying uh, uh, we don't see it, but we see it less, you know, like uh, traffickers are using more sophisticated methods uh, to keep, to recruit victims and to keep victims um, uh, in trafficking chain and uh, like uh, blackmails, like blackmailing, like um, you know, taking photos and then blackmailing that photos will end up on the social networks or families or so on. Also, blackmails regarding families and so on. And also, uh, some, uh, some, somehow it went um, underground. You know, it's not public. In in uh, 2001, 2002, you go on Belgrade streets and you see nightclubs. And it's obvious it's trafficking going on inside. Now it's in private apartments, so usually police has this uh, uh, use this uh, uh, excuse: we cannot do raids in private apartments uh, because we have special measures, and prosecutors they don't give us special measures to use, to be used, and so on. But uh, the truth is that uh, we didn't see many raids, police raids recently. And when they have a case, they, it's only one or two women in the case. In, 90, in 2001, for example, we had cases with 20, 30, 40 women found, trafficked women found in, in one police raid. 
so many things sh have changed, I think, I guess, in, in the last 20 years. And what about uh, Serbians uh, trafficked or exploited abroad? I think mo most uh, of what you spoke about was about foreigners in Serbia. At the beginning of the century, we had more cases of international trafficking, like more actually uh, uh, foreign citizens identify as victims. Now it's opposite. It's 80% of internal uh, domestic citizens identify as victims, which doesn't mean that uh, we don't have international trafficking still and that Serbian citizens are not ending up in some other countries. There are many reasons for that, why we don't have it in the statistics. One of the reasons is again, political, geo, geo strategical and political, it's visa liberalization from 2000 and uh, I forgot my God, it's 2006. Uh, when we got um, visa uh, borders open and we didn't, we don't need to have visas to go to European Union. We don't have information anymore where our citizens are going unless our partners from uh, abroad, from other countries, NGO partners, or sometimes even institutions are calling us and saying, uh, we have a victim of trafficking identified from Serbia. Can you provide some assistance? Can you help with repatriation? Can you provide anything and so on? So that is the way how we find out or when victim is back and then uh, we call this kind of uh, type of calls, post festum calls, when she's out of trafficking change, but she needs some assistance. So she Google and she find Astra or she saw a video clip on TV and then she needs a psychological assistant, medical, or in most of the cases when she got invitation for the court. That is the moment when she's triggered to call us because you will know that victims are afraid to be in the court and to meet trafficker again. And that is why she needs and call for support. We have our citizens abroad. Uh, uh, and we have uh, uh, recently, when I mentioned labor exploitation cases, a uh, majority of these cases actually happened in ex-Soviet Union countries, but more recently also in the European Union, case in Slovakia or cases in France, in Austria. These men are not... Uh, recognize always as victims of trafficking sometimes they are treated like illegal migrants actually labor uh, labor migrant illegal migrants in those countries would you have any specific suggestions for how destination countries could be you know protecting migrants better based on your understanding of the vulnerabilities of of migrant workers from serbia Serbia, actually, not only Serbia, but the whole, um, all countries of ex-Yugoslavia, we traditionally migrate, uh, migrated to Germany, France, Austria, Sweden, um, and um, other countries of EU now. And um, uh, with the majority of these countries, Serbia, for example, has these bilateral agreements, you know, and uh, traditionally we have diaspora in this country. Uh, but uh, we had massive migrations uh, during the 90s, uh, during the war. And uh, also, um, uh, there are some estimations that in the la we have new wave of migrations uh, recently. There are some estimations, actually, that in the last 11 years, half a million of people of Serbia left, left Serbia. And if you uh, take a note that we are 6 million in total, you know, then um, you can imagine it's... Uh, it's pretty much. Nowadays, Serbia became uh, definitely a country of uh, cheap labor. And uh, uh, since a lot of people migrated to the West um, uh, and to the East as well, you know, to some country, Eastern countries, uh, we, uh, there is a space for, for mm, new people to come. So we became country of cheap labor and uh, we uh, identify several cases of labor exploitation of workers from India, Pakistan and other countries now in Serbia. And it's interesting to notice that uh, similar cases that we identify in other countries when Serbian citizens are, citizens are exploited, uh, like the case in Slovakia, for example, they are treated the same way like we are treating the workers from India and Pakistan, like illegal migrants, you know. And uh, uh, it's um, not enough to have laws, to have trafficking, to have exploitation recognized in our laws. When I said in our in, in state laws, 
it's important uh, also to implement those laws. It's not enough to say that we have national refer mechanism. We need to see that this national refer mechanism is working in each case. So, for example, in this Slovakia case, when we uh, when we alarmed the, the, uh, the Slo uh, Slovak and Serbian government to what's going on, because we are talking about hundreds of workers there um, uh, in the well-known factories, you know, we didn't have any reaction, but we need to go further and uh, to do some kind of diplomacy work and uh, uh, do international pressure from international organizations and so on. And then, then is uh, how the case um, became public and that is, then, the, uh, then uh, only then actually both governments reacted by bilateral agreements and helping these people. Until then, they were treated like illegal migrants. So uh, I think it's very uh, uh, important. Actually, the same thing happened in Serba's case, a very famous case from 2009 when uh, workers from Serbia, Bosnia, and uh, Macedonia ended up in Azerbaijan working on the state, uh, state infrastructure project. And the same thing is happening now in Serbia because these Indian and Pakistani workers that I mentioned, actually, they are working on the capital uh, uh, infrastructure uh, state projects in Serbia, you know, they are not working for some small company. So uh, in Serbia, for example, our labor laws and um, similar uh, supporting laws like on employment and agencies and so on are full of holes, you know, and could be misused. And uh, the thing is, all of these agencies that are bringing, bringing the workers here, they are working together for the state and they are working with the state. So it's obvious obvious that um, these holes are used uh, very uh, consciously, you know, uh, and that we need to work a lot on uh, policy and advocacy, uh, on advocacy actually to, to, to see policy changes. Uh, and also we need strong, um, a strong law enforcement and uh, prosecution if we want to see uh, changes uh, in, in practice. That would be advice for the governments actually to uh, implement uh, in practice what they signed and ratified in their countries, whether it's Palermo Protocol, whether it's Council of Europe Convention, which is even more um, human rights oriented and victim centered oriented, let's say. Astra publishes every year um, an analysis of the position of victims in criminal proceedings. Uh, and I know you also uh, do monitoring of the implementation of uh, anti-trafficking laws in the country every year. So I guess my question is, do you see improvements in these areas, particularly in the legal position of victims um, in the country over, over the years? Yes, actually, Astra has a wide scope of activities uh, that, we, that we do, and uh, usually people who come uh, who uh, who come to work in Astra? You know, they uh, after several months they say I couldn't uh, uh, imagine how many topics we are covering. You know, from how many angles. Uh, actually, what we do is we follow the situation on the ground. You know, uh, through the SOS hotline direct uh, and direct uh, contact with the clients and victims of trafficking, potential victims. Uh, so to feel what is the situation in the field. We, we are not a donor-driven organization, so we are not following uh, trends, you know, and uh, what is sexy in this moment in trafficking and so on, which is sometimes financially not good for us, but uh, I can say that we actually were the pioneers in starting uh, some uh, topics uh, in, in trafficking field. I remember one year it was popular to talk about trafficking in children. So everybody was talking about that. And now we also have trafficking in children, but no one is talking because now it's more popular to involve victims in uh, some boards and so on. So next year will be something else. So uh, actually 11 years ago, we start to monitor the court cases on trafficking and to collect the judgments. So actually Astra uh, has uh, the judgments, uh, anti uh, has trafficking judgments in Ser from Serbian courts uh, for, from the very beginning when the, the criminal act was introduced in 2003. 
So we could monitor how uh, the implementation of this criminal act uh, 388 uh, is uh, of the criminal code of Serbia is implemented in practice, but also we are monitoring the court uh, uh, trials thanks to the legal clinics and uh, cooperation with the uh, law universities and students who are in the courtroom. It, it's uh, in a way, it's their practice, you know, because in Serbian, uh, uh, Serbian, uh, when you finish law university in Serbia, you never see a judgment, you never see a, you know, court trial. So this is in a way is a kind of practice for students, but also it's good for us to see what's going on and how victims are treated in the courtroom. So every year we publish this legal and analysis and um, we did it for years voluntarily you know and it's interesting I think it's a very unique in the in the world uh, this year it, it for the first time this uh, legal analysis is supported through the project and uh, what we noticed for example I, I, I can give you only several uh, several findings from last year for example uh, is that uh, still implementation of the criminal code and other supporting laws in practice are not uh, good enough. Even uh, there are very good solutions in the laws and Serbian laws are in 90, let's say 90% or 95% are very in line with the EU laws and uh, international standards. Uh, implementation of these solutions, legal solutions, are not good in practice. So, for example, uh, Serbian uh, criminal procedure law allows a judge to uh, a judge to give a, a, a victim of trafficking a special status of specially vulnerable witness, which means a lot of things to to victim, like not being in the same room with the trafficker, testifying through the video link, not repeating the testimony several times, and so on and so on. But in practice, we noticed that only actually in 30% of cases it was used. Then um, uh, it's interesting, for example, that uh, um, uh, every year we have smaller and smaller number of judgments on trafficking. There are many reasons for that. One of the reasons is that victims are not identified and police are not uh, making files against traffickers, uh, not working uh, proactively investigating the criminal act of trafficking, police and prosecution. And then it resulted with smaller number of judgments in the final phase. But also uh, one of the reason is that uh, uh, many uh, uh, cases of trafficking end up with the settlements with traffickers. But uh, for example, last year we noticed that half of all the court cases ended up with settlement with traffickers. And in nine out of 10 of these cases, actually what prosecute the prosecutor did was prequalification of the criminal act of trafficking to mediation in prosecution, which is a smaller criminal act. So trafficker actually uh, is just a pimp, treated as a pimp, uh, and uh, got some very, very small sentence, like one month of jail, not even that. And then uh, also he needs to pay some fine and he's um, released. And victim is not treated as a victim. Actually, trafficked person is not uh, treated as traffic person, even she was willing to cooperate and uh, she gave testimony and repeated her testimony several times and so on. Average sentence for trafficking in Serbia, according to our analysis last year, uh, is three to five years of jail. Um, even uh, according to the Serbian law for the basic criminal act of trafficking is three to 12 years of jail and uh, uh, then for uh, more severe uh, types of trafficking, it's even bigger. So average is three to five. And uh, it's uh, for us as a, a human rights uh, organization and victim centered uh, uh, oriented organization, it's important to know also that only 30% of all uh, traffic persons in the courtroom uh, had the legal support. They had a lawyer with them in the courtroom, which is a very poor number. So only one third, actually. Also, uh, the last but not the least, compensation issue is something that we are, uh, together with our colleagues from La Strada International and other NGOs, are uh, indicating for so many years that compensation is not working in the practice, that victims are referred to civil procedure, which is long and cost uh, non-cost efficient. 
So out of these uh, 540 victims that we supported, now, only three of them received compensation, judgment of compensation, and only one managed to implement that judgment. You know, in no other cases, there, uh, there is no compensation for victims, and there is no compensation fund still. So, in the report that European Commission published uh, yesterday uh, on uh, uh, progress uh, country report on Serbia, one of the issues they mentioned is compensation for victims. So, trafficking is very weak. I cannot say that situation is better when you uh, when you look uh, to these statistics uh, and data. Um, we can say that there are individuals now uh, who are more sensitive to the trafficking issue. Like we have a sensitive judge, we have a sensitive prosecutor, we have a sensitive uh, uh, police officer. But that's not systematic approach. You know, we we need all of them to to understand the, the topic and the issue and uh, uh, to treat the victim properly in the courtroom and uh, uh, through the whole system, not only in the courtroom, but from the first moment, first contact until the final reintegration. And uh, this is something that we in Astra are um, uh, working and hoping that will happen one day. I mean, uh, individuals are making the system, but they are not the system, you know, because if we lose that one prosecutor, which is good, for example, he changed the town or prosecution or he changed his job, uh, we don't have other solution, you know, and that's, that's not systematic approach. Given the 20 years experience that you've had and the shifts that you've just described, how do you think um, the anti-trafficking protocol or the framework for practicing anti-trafficking can be improved? We should mention also the recent, I mean, ongoing pandemic and the changes uh, that happened. And we, uh, we also should think uh, how we should better implement Palermo protocol, but also how we should adjust our work to the new situation and uh, uh, new trends and uh, you know I, I have this feeling the traffickers always are faster than us you know and um, uh, it's definitely uh, this situation with corona showed that things will go more online not only our meetings and conferences and so on but also recruitment recruitment was already online you know majority of the victims in the last 10 years that we supported uh, actually, we were recruited uh, uh, online, again, through the lover boy method ads, uh, job ads, and so on, but mo mostly online. Uh, but also now, uh, trafficking is moving online. Uh, our support during Corona was, you know, more online than live. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we should... Uh, work in, in that um, uh, sense more, but also uh, what would I like to see is um, Palermo protocol to be more operative uh, and more, uh, you know, implemented on the more, more uh, implemented in the real life, uh, in the ground, on the ground, like uh, it would be good to have this monitoring mechanism that uh, we are talking uh, recently about. So how, uh, gover what governments will do to improve the implementation of Palermo protocol, not only in papers and reports, but in real life, you know. And uh, we have Greta as a mechanism for Council of Europe uh, Convention. We would need the uh, Palermo protocol to be uh, mm, more more uh, implemented in practice. I know that we always say that Palermo and uh, uh, UN Convention is more uh, is more technocratic and uh, you know bureaucratic and so on. And uh, Council of Europe uh, Convention is more pro victim uh, oriented. But uh, I must say that I really like Palermo because um, it's the it was the first one and it gave the definition for the first time. And we should think about changing maybe the definition because nowadays we see some new forms of trafficking that we didn't know about 20 years ago. Some new forms of um, uh, 
and uh, uh, different uh, variations of labor exploitation, for example. And now we have discussion, is it a violation of labor rights? Is it a labor exploitation and so on? So definitely we would need some modifications, but uh, also it's important to implement it, implement it properly, even what we have now. Um, also, uh, uh, I think uh, we need uh, much more uh, uh, advocacy and uh, actions towards policy changes. And sometimes uh, grassroots NGOs uh, don't have capacity to do that. You know, we cannot do everything, work with the victim and lobby and go uh, and publicly speak and so on. But I think it's important that those who are doing that has connection with those who are on the, on the ground, you know, so that the voice of the victim is heard properly and the situation from the ground actually is uh, monitored rapidly, not in 10 years to talk about some Thing that happened, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago. And um, I think uh, on one hand, we need more of this diplomacy and uh, uh, advocacy actions, but uh, personally, I would like to see more guerrilla actions. You know, I'm very proud of some investigative journalists in Serbia who entered the factories uh, that we know that are violating the rights of the workers uh, inside and who pretend that they are workers and do investigative journalism from inside and more of such things. And I think it's very important to talk publicly. What worries me uh, a lot is that recently we heard a lot of voices of regular people, uh, but also you know some NGOs and some uh, new consultants and researchers who, re who recently were in NGOs or, you know, working on, on some researchers now saying, you know, but labor exploitation is everywhere. If you, uh, if you are talking that way, then half of Serbia are exploited because half of Serbia are not getting salaries and so on. We cannot um, accept this as normal. And I think it's uh, very important to speak publicly about it and to use every situation to say, no, it's not normal. <laughs> no, exploitation, it's not normal and it shouldn't be.